but I think that that's more just like lifestyle choices Dude, than it is. Dude, if Call of Duty 18 hours a day, mm-hmm. it's going to have an effect on you. And it's not even because you're shooting people 18 hours a day. It's because you are not engaging with society 18 <laughs> yeah, hours okay. a day. Yeah. <laughs> this week on Backward Compatible, Doc and Chris discuss whether games are capable of teaching empathy and what impact they might have on the culture. Plus, impressions of Nuka World and Civilization VI, a review of School Splitter Dice, and designer insights from the Rolling It system. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 83 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, Games and New Media with a Splash of Academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Doc. Hey, everybody. And Jim is unfortunately not with us. He is uh, predisposed doing something that is highly classified, um, but rest assured that uh, next week he'll be joining us for our Thanksgiving special from an uh, undisclosed location. Uh, but in the meantime, it's just, uh, it's just me and Doc. Can we, can we talk about that? Um, only, only to say that it's highly classified. Oh. That's, that's the... Uh, that's the official line from those who shall not be named. Oh, wow. Yeah. I didn't know Voldemort was in on this. <laughs> no, they, not, not he. Oh. <laughs> and so, Doc, how about you tell us a little bit about our uh, meaty topic of discussion for today? All right. Today, I want to talk about empathy. I want you to stick with us so that you can understand what it is we're saying uh, whenever, we, whenever we talk about this and our feelings, because we're going to talk about feelings today and try to, try to get inside each other's heads a little bit and uh, understand. No. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, though, what I do want to talk about is the idea of can games teach us empathy? Uh, is is technology something that uh, helps us with our empathy? Hurts our empathy? Mm-hmm. Is it is it sheltering us from real meaningful connection? Uh, is it something we need to worry about? Not worry about? Um, you know, I, I honestly, empathy, I think, is, is the number one problem right now mm-hmm. in uh, social media and, and our ability to connect with other people. And so um, in, our, in our games, especially our video games, you know, how does empathy play into game design? Mm-hmm. And we've talked a little bit about empathy before um, in different, different other podcasts, but today we're really going to kind of dig down and get a little bit philosophical, I think. We're yeah. going to talk broadly about the concept of empathy. Yeah, let's drill down. Yeah, drill down. so it should be an interesting discussion. But uh, in the meantime, we're going to go and get on with the show, including some opening segments such as the butt mosh. Get ready for the butt mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. Well, Chris, I want to talk about Nuka World. As you may or may not recall, um, Fallout 4 for me was a game that I loved, I raved, and I abandoned. <laughs> Pretty much after coming to the Conclave and the, the various plots that, that came with that and the, the cheesy fake out, just basically the bad writing, mm. honestly, is really what it came down to. Which is unfortunate given that this is like the big deal this time was that everything's voice acted. So. Yeah, and, it, and they did a great job with the voice acting, mm. honestly. The acting's fantastic. The writing is terrible. Mm. Um, you know, the the interesting thing about now are you talking are you talking like line to line writing? Or are you talking like plot writing? No, I'm talking about the overall plot. Mm. the The line to line is actually not that bad. Mm-hmm. It just really, is, it just doesn't feel like it goes anywhere. You don't have that crescendo, the poetic moment, the oh wow, I can't believe that just happened. But you can tell where it's supposed to be, mm. and and it's like oh. Nah. Now I'm talking about I'm talking about Fallout Four specifically, the mm. main line stuff. But um, Nuka World is DLC. Okay, so the the fact that uh, I, I prepaid for. Um, all of the the content with the pass and and did that this time. I thought, you know what? I'll go ahead and I'll download the stuff as it comes. I will enjoy it as it comes. I actually enjoyed the little uh, the robotics one and that sort of thing, but they were really small, really mm. kind of tiny. Okay, Nickel World's big. Um, it's not like uh, twice as much of the original game big, but it's uh, a good solid weekend at least big. Okay, okay. So I spent about a week or so um, playing in the evenings and really enjoying the. Uh, the world. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna put it that way. I really enjoyed the world. I will go out on a limb and say that it is the most interesting, compelling, and well-crafted world in the Fallout universe mm-hmm. of 
anything since the beginning of the game. But that's where the the fun stops. Mm. And again, oh, there's a writing problem because the way that they hook you to get in is the way they normally do, which is, oh, you've just gotten a new broadcast. You need to listen to it. And you listen to the ad. And the ad says, come to Nuka World. And you do that from the transit station. It's well written and it's done. <laughs> you get in there and then you discover that it's blockaded by raiders. Oh, no, raiders. Ah. <laughs> uh, and so you kill the raiders and then you go in and there's a guy and he's dying. And you're like, let me help you. No, 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 don't help me. Go down the tram because it's a tram in a monorail, right? Because <laughs> it's Disney. Yeah. Um, and, and you're like, go on the monorail and save my my wife and my daughter okay i will totally do this and they're like but something's kind of fishy i'm being railroaded here or monorailed here <laughs> and you get down there and you and you do that and then you very very quickly th- discover things are not as they seem and um i will give this spoiler so spoiler alert uh raiders the whole thing's been taken over by raiders so basically it was um uh, kind of like a walled city, or really rather five walled cities, uh, that then was taken over by uh, traders, and then taken over by three gangs of raiders mm. who banded together under the leadership of one man. Three, three times Super Bowl champions. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> who, who uh, this guy, he's pretty stupid. Mm. Um, and, and as is sort of classic post-apocalypse uh, lore, if you beat him, you become the leader, oh, right? Yeah. So stupidly, he gets in there and he's invincible. But then you uh, discover there's a conspiracy to, to take him down. You throw no real talent of your own, mm. do so, and then suddenly all three of those raider camps are like, "Hey, boss, hey, over boss, hey." And so you're walking around Nukaland, and you're like, "These guys are scum. They're they're raiders. They're they're normal. Ra- These are the guys that for the entire time I've been playing Fallout." I have gone into these settlements and I have cleaned them out and I have killed them for the good of humanity. Yeah. They're the scum of the earth. One of them, the disciples, literally have dead people who are eviscerated and crucified, mm. hanging around inside of their base, um, blood everywhere. It's the typical super psychopath, serial killer type stuff that you see in these raiders camps sometimes. Mm-hmm. Your compulsion, or at least my compulsion, I hope your compulsion, is Mm. to immediately want to uh, find their leader, shoot them, and take all their stuff. Mm. You can't. Because if you do this, this starts the war. And the war is you against everyone in Nukaland. Oh, fun. Yeah. So you better be prepared for that if you choose to do that. Um, Also, there's a mission for it, but it's really, really hard to find. And if you do it, it cuts out about 70% of the curated content. Ah, 70% 70% of the mission, 70% of the everything. So I played it as I'm fooling these guys. Mm. I'm pretending to go along. I'll let them think that I am their boss, get all the cool stuff, and when I get to the very end of it, then uh, I'll just assassinate the leaders because I'll be much stronger then. Mm. Um, th- the, the fact that I had to do that and you had to play it as a bad guy, basically, mm-hmm. Uh, really limited my fun. It felt like it was against the the entire philosophy upon which Fallout is supposed to be based, the Mm. idea of choice. Um, Somebody had a very railroaded kind of story they wanted to tell. They had a great idea for the world. And um, you get thrust in it. And if you're not willing to engage in this idea of you are a bad guy, I just dare say you're not going to have that much fun. And I think that's why the ratings for it in various places like Steam are just not that high. Mm. They just have not been very good, Um, which is a shame because there's a lot of really good stuff in there, especially if you are a a Central Florida born and bred (laughs) kind of guy like me whose idea of of coming home, because, you know, I lived overseas, Mm -hmm. uh, but every time we came home for the summer, man, it was like, we're going to go to Disney, we're going to go to (laughs) MGM, we're going to go to Universal, whatever. Um, Man, if you love that kind of stuff, I think you will really love exploring. If you're an explorer game type like me, I think you're really going to love exploring uh, the the Nuka World expansion. If you're doing it for the plot and the achievements and that sort of thing, it's it's kind of more of the same. Mm. You're gonna you're gonna kill stuff. Uh, you're gonna find feral ghouls. You're gonna find that sort of thing. Um, but there's some really neat backstory there. Some really interesting kind of um, world. I just again. I'm, I'm overall disappointed with where Fallout has gone mm. in terms of revealing and revealing and, and reveling. Mm-hmm. And just, I don't know. I, I, I still feel like I've abandoned it. Even though I played through that particular subplot, getting back out and just sort of popping back out into the Commonwealth, I'm like, oh yeah, this... So I'm sure uh, if Jim were here, he would uh, talk about how it's because it's Bethesda and Bethesda is the one that uh, has ruined Fallout 
and that uh, you know Fallout New Vegas was so much better than three because it was. Um, Oh, what was it? Obsidian? I think it was Obsidian. Yeah, uh, it, I'm familiar uh, with his it, politics. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, well, we'll, we'll just uh, we'll just sort of go with that, though, knowing that we uh, we, we know how that discussion would go. So uh, recently, what I've been playing is Civilization VI, or uh, V, <laughs> as some of us call it. V. 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 I. Oh, V. I. Yeah. Just no. Just V. Just V. I got you. V. Okay. Oh, I guess it would be V. <laughs> what Civ Six does is it takes everything that was good about Five and it refines it and streamlines streamlines it and it um really gives you this really excellent experience. Everything is like really oh, well thought out. They, they changed whatever needed to be changed. They kept whatever needed to be kept. Um, they even reimagined certain things. So, for instance, I think I mentioned when I was previewing this a few episodes back, um, cities now, rather than building just buildings within the cities on one tile, cities now can have what's called a district, where you build a district for that city in a different tile, and then that tile can be upgraded with new buildings and stuff like that. Wow. But you can sort of strategically place, for example, your military district um, um, in a way that's like you know, sort of cutting off um, the enemy from invading your capital, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, and there, there's so many things. I'm not going to go into every single uh, the feature right now, just because it would take much longer than we have in this segment. Mm-hmm. Um, but one of the one of the really neat things that they've changed um, that I really like personally is now, whereas before you could you had culture and you were trying to accumulate culture and the more culture you had, the more the more quickly you'd be able to get new sort of social upgrades and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Now they actually have a civics tree that's separate from your technology tree. Oh, wow. um, so your science and your culture work similarly but separately. Um, and so they didn't have that in Civ Two. <laughs> yeah. um, and so it's actually possible, for example, to reach the classical age culturally before you reach it technologically. Um, just as one example, really. Um, so it's really it's really quite neat. And when you get these um, these cultural advances, these civics, um, depending on what it is, I'm, I'm drawing a blank exactly on which one specifically give you what. Um, but you get these policies that you can enact, and you have a certain number of slots for different policies based on your government. So, um, for example, if you're a government that's more uh, economy-focused, say like a merchant republic, you're going to have more slots for economic policies and fewer for military, whereas you've got something like autocracy, you're going to have a lot more military slots and fewer economic or social pl- slots, that sort of thing, or uh, diplomatic. And... Uh, every time you get a new civic, you get a chance for free to change up some of your policies. And so you're actually seeing as your civilization progresses how the civilization itself, the way its policies work, um, will change over time um, in a way that's actually meaningful um, mechanically, but also in the sense that different civilizations, say, might not like you if you you have a different government than they do. Um, So if you've got oligarchy, people who also have oligarchy are more likely to like... That's kind of always been true, hasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that's what Uh, it, it is, and yet... I think it's more meaningful now. It's mm. not just sort of like making the choice for a few buffs. Yeah. It's making a choice for those buffs plus the way that it's going to change your policies. Hey, we have communism. <laughs> you have communism. But hey. it's also it's also more granular, though, which I think is cool because, you know, in real life, in history, things aren't always as simple as just like, hey, here's democracy and here's communism. And yeah. like they're, they're in here. <laughs> but you could be a democracy that has a lot of socialist aspects mm-hmm. because you can still research. Um, I think it's class struggle is the thing that gets you um, right. communism. Right. And so but you can still research class struggle if you're a democracy and you can apply the things that you could apply in communism to your democratic government. That makes sense. Um, There's another really cool feature I'll touch on briefly. Diplomacy Mm -hmm. is much more interesting in this game. Mm -hmm. Um, Declaring war, they're actually, you can research policies that allow you to declare war for different reasons, which will either give you, say, no warmonger penalty or will give you, like, less into warmonger penalty than just declaring war used to. Oh, that's kind of cool. So, for example, you can do, like, a uh, war of liberation. You can uh, declare war on someone who has taken over the city of yourself or an ally um, so that you can take back that city. And you don't get a warmonger penalty for co- declaring that war. But yeah, it's it's a really, really awesome game. If you've never played Civ before, this is a great time to try it. If you have played Civ before, I think this is, at least in my opinion, the best Civ there's been. I have played Civ, Civ 2, Civ 3, mm-hmm. and Civ the board game, both versions. Ah, nice. <laughs> and... Watch Let's Plays on the rest? <laughs> there you go. Uh, but yeah, no, this one is absolutely um, fantastic in so many ways. Uh, I definitely recommend it. Yeah, you're actually making me want to pick it up. Yeah, there you go. Now it's time for Table Talk. Discussions on tabletop games of all kinds. All right, so I have a confession to make. Um, I did a little bit of trolling on the internet the other day, yes. uh, and it had nothing to do with politics, which... You know, <laughs> Uh, no, it actually had to do with an ad 
because I know how Facebook ads are generated and I know it's based on demographics and I know that they tend to put things in front of me that I'm supposed to be interested in and it, it, it frustrates me when they get it right, especially. <laughs> well, in this case, uh, something called Skull Splitter Dice, metal dice uh, in a custom um, container tin was being sold for like I don't know, it was like $39, and it was on sale <laughs> from 50-something. I got you. And so I'm like, why in the world would I spend 50 bucks on metal dice <laughs> whenever uh, I roll them once and my glass top table breaks? <laughs> and so I basically said this. Um, and it turns out that the... Um, Owner of the company and, <laughs> and, and PR manager um, response <laughs> to what I say on Oops. this ad. Oops. Uh, because they're a small company, kind of like Doc and Kruger, mm-hmm. and, and frankly, run by nice guys who are doing some really cool stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, I bantered back and forth with them about it, and I said, uh, rather jokingly, uh, all right, listen, you, you, you send me a copy of these dice, and, and I will test them mm-hmm. and give a report on mm-hmm. backward compatible. Mm-hmm. And next thing I know, I'm getting a PM saying, what's your address? Uh, so uh, they actually, so we can come to your house. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and beat you up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, they didn't. They actually, they actually sent me um, everything they said they were going to. Uh, now, I want, I want to be clear on this. Skull Splitter Dice is um, clearly about the dice experience. Mm. It's not just about these um, very well crafted dice, and I'm not just saying that because they sent them to me for free. Mm-hmm. If it was it was crap, I would actually say it was crap. But it's not. Mm-hmm. They've got some heft value. Um, you you know you pick these things up and you're like, whoa, dude, I feel like powerful, right? <laughs> um, but w- to my surprise, what I ended up getting was an email from the dwarf. Mm. Here here is how it reads. I will give my best uh, dwarf impression. Dear Adam. <laughs> a messenger has just come down from the surface with news of your purchase. His beard smelled of rain and wind. Long has it been since I've been outside the belly of this mountain. Don't misunderstand. Complain I do not. This rock, these walls, this forge, these tools, the, these are those from which legend is crafted. You have chosen well, human. The fires from which thine dice shall both burn hot today. <laughs> anyway, there's more. <laughs> there's, there's actually quite a bit more. Um, but it ends with, in short time I will be finished, and then you can expect them to be shipped according to the details below. Right? <laughs> and so what's fun is, these guys understand, uh, clearly understand their audience. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is role play happening here. Yeah. Um, they, they, you, you actually showed me at the email at one point, and I think my comment was that the uh, the dialogue is a little bit overwrought. Uh, <laughs> like, not necessarily in a bad way. Well, but no. It's, it's definitely like, this is role play dialogue. I was going to say, yeah. well, you know, this is, this is a GM yeah. telling me. I mean, it, it gets to the point where it's like... Um, uh, Enough with words to work to work. Always glorious work. In the meantime, contact my messenger if you have questions. He's given me this cryptic means of communication. Some wizardry called email. <laughs> Elvish mail, I'm guessing. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So it's like, all right, I get it. Nice. Um, these guys are having fun with it. And, and, and I'm not just paying for high quality, uh, very heavy dice. Uh, the, the, the fundamental purpose of which I have yet to figure out <laughs> why they're so heavy. Mm. Other than to simply make me feel like a warrior as mm. I roll them. Mm. I, I have not yet had the courage to roll them on my glass top dice. <laughs> uh, or to clean them on my glass top uh, table. Is that the whole reason you were testing them? Though? I mean, Which is the whole reason. <laughs> uh, but I will, I will say that I did roll it on someone else's glass top table and survived just fine. So mm-hmm. I'm not endorsing um, them for the purpose of, of glass top play. <laughs> However, I will say <laughs> glass is a bit sturdier than we give it credit for. True. Uh, that said, uh, I also recommend that you uh, definitely not put them in a slingshot and, uh, and shoot them at someone. One, I think you'd probably kill them ah. uh, because these things are sharp mm. and they are heavy, they are deadly, and they just look really cool. I got to choose the color, the style. It came in a little stylized tent mm. with uh, with foam that, that, that kind of coddles it, you know. Mm. And, and even the box itself that it came in, the cardboard box that it came in, had um, the logo of the company on it. Mm. And it looked like it was like branded on there, and it wasn't. <laughs> but it looked, you know. And I'm just like, I'm imagining, wow, the dwarf had this in his head. There is no dwarf. <laughs> <laughs> but, 
but it, it worked. Yeah. Um, and so, as in terms of the dice experience, mm. um, Skull Splitter dice really did a good job, uh, I think, of of making that happen. Mm. And I actually got a chance to take a look at them briefly myself. And um, what was interesting to me is that. One, that, that heft, when you roll them, is nice. I can definitely see the appeal in that. Yeah, I could get used to that. But a lot of times when you have these, these metal dice, kind of like this, they're very ornate or they're very uh, decorative. To the point where, like, I almost feel bad rolling them just because you're afraid that you're going to damage them. So, yeah, like, kind of like, yeah. them on display and, like, maybe put them on your desk. It's kind of like, hey, look, I'm a role player and these are cool looking dice. Um, but this, like, these were very, um, and maybe there are other styles that I didn't get to see, but these felt very utilitarian. They were kind yeah. of just like, you know, sort of like a flat finish. It was just like metal. With Easy the, like, to read. Yeah. Ni- nice indent. The lettering was very clear, which was nice. Or yeah. numbering, I, guess, I should you know, say. You break out the Cthulian dice mm-hmm. and you're like, hold on, I need to get out my tome so I can know what it is that I yeah. just rolled. And these so, are not this way. Yeah, yeah. And these are, um, these are... They, they, they seem like they're going to be durable. They seem like they're going to last you a long time. That they weren't going to get damaged when you were using them. No, they'll um, still be around after I'm dead. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, you know the the typical plastic dice that we go and buy for like you know ten fifteen bucks or whatever mm-hmm. for a set of polys. Um, like those those numbers tend to fade a little bit and that sort of deal. Yeah. Um, so kinda... I would genuinely be upset if I lost one of these dice mm-hmm. um, because I know that uh, as a set they're beautiful and. I, you know, it's not like losing a plastic die where you're like, oh man, I really like that that weird mm-hmm. that one orange one or whatever. Yeah, you know, uh, I have one plastic die that I took with me to Oxford, England, and put on uh, C.S. Lewis's desk mm-hmm. and took a picture of it there. So, um, you know, I have my own little personal fiction with that one. <laughs> but but the rest of my plastic dice, I'm like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Uh, but these guys, I'm going to treasure these guys for a while. I really am, and, and I'm even thinking about picking up another set or two mm-hmm. just so that when we play something that has d6s, mm-hmm. and I need two or three d6s, I can roll those to get. You know what I'm saying? Instead of having to roll the same one, so right. Times, yeah. um, and that's the only drawback I see to, to really investing in a specific dice. I've always felt that way though. Mm-hmm. Like when you get a specific color of a specific die set, and you mm-hmm. get the traditional t, you know, d20 set, which is what this is. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so I would love it if Skull Splitter would would like you know sell a bunch of D sixes mm. or a bunch of D tens for some of these other systems. Gotcha. You and I, we, we play lots of different systems. Our mm. regular group, you know, floats from system to system. Yeah. Partly as market research, but partly <laughs> for the program. Yeah. Um, so you know, we have a lot of fun with it. Either way, uh, go check out Skull Splitter Dice um, on their website, and uh, I have been given exclusive. Uh, Access and permission. Mm-hmm. This is not a uh, this is not a paid advertisement, but uh, <laughs> I, I I can give you a code which will give you fifteen percent off if you do make a, uh, a a purchase. So that is new adventurer fifteen. Mm. So just go ahead and put that in there, and uh, you can get fifteen percent off of your order of Skull Splitter on uh, what I expect is already low prices because they've been having a sale. So there you go. Cool. is Role Play for Role Play, the mechanics of tabletop role playing games. We've talked a little bit about our uh, game that we've been designing. Uh, since this is just me and Doc, we thought we'd kind of do the Doc and Kruger cast here. Doc uh, and Kruger. And uh, talk a little bit about a game that we are hoping to release fairly soon, uh, the Roll With It system, which is, of course, the system that we're designing to be kind of the proprietary, if not the go-to system, definitely one we want to use a lot for our show, Roll With It. Yeah, that's our other show, guys. If you've never checked out our actual play show, Roll With It, it's at uh, backward-compatible.com along with everything else. Yep. We work really hard to... Well, okay, I'll, I'll preface that with Chris works really hard. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of us just screw around. Yeah. But um, to, to actually kind of um, produce that, it's mm-hmm. a produced show in various levels, and, and it's a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Um but so we we talked a little bit about this game before, um, kind of our we we gave like brief impressions of having played it during a play test and stuff like that. But today we wanted to sort of dig a little bit deeper into how it works and some of the mechanics. Yeah, let's do. Um, so first of all, I guess the thing you need to know is it's a diceless system. It is. Um, it's completely diceless. We've also designed it with the idea in mind that since Roll with It is a show where we're trying to have episodic content, we wanted to sort of build into the game an episodic format. Yeah. Um, we wanted to make it so that like you could play, you know, it's not necessarily one one play session equals one episode because we tend to sit down and we record for a whole afternoon yeah, we when do. we do a season of Roll mm-hmm. With It. Um, but we wanted to have like sort of a, a, a clearer point at which we say, okay, that's this episode. We're going to can that one and move on to the next episode. Right. There are other systems that do that really yeah. well, like uh, Prime Time, Prime Time, Time yeah, sort of um, yeah, so it's, there's several games that do that. And so what we have is uh, five scenes per episode um, and 
each player is given a certain number of cards, and we call these story element cards. Mm -hmm. Um, And so your story element cards are simultaneously kind of your randomizer, in a sense. Um, It is your... It's your... It's the equivalent of your dice, and it's also um, kind of the equivalent of your character sheet, because each card is going to have something about your character that you want to highlight in the story. And so when it's your turn to open a scene, you're going to put down one of these cards, and whatever's on that card is going to kind of either be the subject of the scene or play into the subject of the scene. Exactly. And we're talking about, you know, regular index cards here, blank mm-hmm. index cards that you write. Yeah. Uh, so this is not something you're purchasing. I mean, uh, once, you, once you've got the system, you can just grab a sheet of paper, cut it up six mm-hmm. ways, and, and you're good to go. Yeah. And it's a generic system, too. It's meant to be usable in any setting. Right. Yeah. I prefer universal. Universal. Oh, no, that's taken. <laughs> yeah. Well, generic is too, I guess. Right? Well, yeah, they, uh, they, they used both. Uh, so, Doc, do you want to break down a little bit kind of how, how the cards work as far as, like, the star value and that sort of thing? Yeah, how, yeah. How uh, actually, I, I really think that this is an important difference between this system and some of the other dice systems that are out there. Uh, you've got a story element, but you can also add weight to that story element, and you do it through star value. Mm. And the star value is basically how important that thing is to your character. So the standard way that you start is that you have... Have, um, six points that you can create the the cards and the the stars with, and you can assign all three stars to one of your three cards, or you can uh, buy an extra card and only have two stars to assign, or you can put one star on each of three cards. That kind of a thing. What's cool about it is the person who has the most cards is going to be the one opening the scene, and they're going to decide what that scene is about. Now, this is not the kind of system where the GM uh, has a pre-programmed story ready to go. This is not about uh, uh, you know having scenarios, that kind of thing. This is about cooperative, ad-libbing, and... Um, sort of failing forward together <laughs> and all these <laughs> these kinds of things. The GM um, kind of steers the whole thing. And yeah. so the GM is ultimately the one who's responsible for making sure the story is going in a coherent direction. Yeah, that's exactly but right. But the players also have a very big hand, no pun intended, <laughs> in um, deciding what each scene is going to be about. That's right. Um, and so the nice thing about it is that if you know if you haven't played in a little while and you've ended up with with some cards in your hand, you're pretty much guaranteed to be able to open a scene. And so you can make that scene about an element of your character. And and say your character is um, struggling with the fact that uh, he's lost his father. I just made that up off the top of my head. That's one of his character elements. Um, And so you play that card because you're searching for your father, and you continue to look for clues to searching your father. And the team that's with you to help you do this, let's say they're archaeologists or something, um, you know, they're they're there in his old dig site, and they're looking for, for that. And then that scene becomes about that thing, and people can play in. The GM sets the obstacle based on cards that have been played previously, Previously, and a few of the GM's native cards mm-hmm. that have no character element on them. They just have star value. Mm-hmm. And through a, a sequence of uh, playing cards and taking away cards, you discover who has the higher star value for the scene, and that's who wins the scene and is basically able to uh, narrate how it, it concludes. Mm-hmm. Now, the GM has a certain amount of uh, called veto power, and especially when it comes to information, mm-hmm. the, the GM always is the one with the information if they're trying to learn something. Uh, but in terms of uh, knowing that you succeeded jumping from the building, you can narrate your own success. Mm-hmm. And, and that's one of the fun things about it is um, there's... There's not this moment, this 1 in 20 uh, (laughs) chance that you're going to do something superhuman and 1 in 20 chance that you're going to fail. And then you have to kind of figure out how to – I'm talking about D20 here Mm -hmm. – figure out how to make the story work anyway even though you just failed miserably. Mm -hmm. It's not that type of a system. This is a narrative-driven system where everyone's collectively telling the story. And I just – I love that part of it. It's Mm -hmm. not about – it's not about rolling – over a pre-selected, you know, difficulty mm-hmm. number. Um, it's simply about I have three stars. You have two stars. Mm-hmm. Okay, I have I have dominance in this in mm-hmm. the scene. I have narrative control in the scene. And it can kind of be played a little bit strategically in the sense that you can sort of come out the come out guns blazing, so to speak, and play a super high powered card in the early scenes. But then the GM now has that card that you just played in yeah. their hand, so then they have a higher obstacle that they can put down. And everyone else does too. Yeah. yeah. So what it means is you, the stuff you do is going to kind of come back to bite you, mm-hmm. uh, probably, <laughs> but not necessarily. Now there's a couple of ways that you can um, sort of short circuit the whole process. And this is where I think that the system really, really shines, and that's in epiphanies and abandonments. Yep. So let's let's talk about those two. <laughs> okay. So abandonments and epiphanies are basically your way of manipulating the cards in a specific way to 
basically either automatically win or sort of turn things around and help you win. So first there are abandonments, and these are both mechanical and narrative things. You have to kind of have a good thing you're doing narratively in order to justify the mechanical uh, thing that you're doing. So for example, if the GM puts down one of my cards that has any number of stars on it, um, it's not like the story element isn't necessarily playing into what he's doing because the GM is not looking at the story element. He's just looking at star value. But if one of my cards is part of the obstacle and we're behind in our star values, um, I can actually take that card, tear it, literally de- like destroying it and taking it out of the game mm-hmm. to abandon the story element, um, which is to say that narratively I'm doing something that is changing my character. Uh, I'm, for example, I think in one of the games that we were doing um, – I had a character who uh, had a story element, um, attitude of gratitude. Oh yeah, and he was just he was just annoyingly like optimistic and like all the time like you know kind of like trying to be the moderator and the peacemaker and all mm-hmm. this different stuff. And something happened in the story where um, he became very disillusioned, and so I actually destroyed that because I thought it was a, an appropriate time for his character to change. Right, and we used that to help boost ourselves up into the win for that scene. Yeah. Um, and it basically, it means that you know they've had a paradigm shift of some kind mm-hmm. and, and that kind of thing. But that's different from an epiphany, mm-hmm. which is where they, they learn something amazing and sort of transcend the character mm-hmm. to a new level. Mm-hmm. So talk about that. So epiphanies, um, you can only have in, your, in the game at any given time. So this is like whether it's in your hand or the GM's or discarded for the round. You as a character can only have one card that's three stars. So the rest can, are capped at two stars. Right. And the three star card, when it's three stars and you've played it in a scene, not the GM played it, but you've played it, um, you are, or rather, you have to have opened the scene. So the GM can play it, but it has to be your scene. Mm-hmm. Um, you can take that card, tear it, and um, it used to just be kind of like something positive. Now it can either be positive or negative, depending on what's appropriate for the oh, story. Yeah. Sometimes you, but you, you learn have, too late the yeah. lessons you should have known. <laughs> exactly. Um, but narratively, you have an epiphany. And it's something that kind of like takes... Your, your character has this realization of some sort that kind of like really redefines them. Mm-hmm. And it's going to change the story. And you actually get bonuses for having done that. But you, um, when you tear that card, you automatically win the scene, period. Um, it's not like you're reducing the obstacle and still have a chance to lose, potentially. It's just you win that scene. That character will happening. remember that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and then, of course, uh, the other thing that this does is there's a there's a cap to your hand size um, throughout the game. And so tearing your cards also gives you a chance to introduce new story elements and That's to right. keep changing your character. So the idea is that over the course of this, um, we, we have kind of a, a suggestion of 12 episodes per season. Yeah. Um, Which is basically the half-season model mm-hmm. for television. Yeah. Um, um, or sort of the British model, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, and over the course of this 12-episode season, you're going to have removed some cards, you're going to have added some cards, you're going to have strengthened some cards, um, to the point where the idea is that through the gameplay, you are changing your character, and ultimately stories, I think, are about character change yeah. one way or the other. Um, you can get a little bit more granular and kind of define different genres in different ways and all this different stuff, but ultimately, stories are about characters and the way that they change. That's right. Or don't. No. So you don't fall into that problem that Nuka World had of having this great setting and uh, nothing nothing happening <laughs> to the characters. It's about the characters and, and the story setting um, can either be all GM or it can be a cooperative thing or whatever. One of the, one of the things I love about the system, actually, is the complete complete and total lack of setting, that it is mm-hmm. setting agnostic. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, whenever we sat down originally to design this, um, we were thinking about some of the things we'd done with Roll With It in the past and mm-hmm. some of the systems we'd used in the past. Uh, Eden Program comes to mind, mm-hmm. specifically, as something that had that five uh, s- episode structure and, and all of that. Fives are important to me, mm-hmm. uh, especially because whenever you look at like the short story formula, mm-hmm. um, you know, Freytag's Pyramid, that kind of a thing, and I've done research on that mm-hmm. uh, and, and written about it, basically what you've got is that conflict, that inciting action, mm-hmm. which has rising action leading to a climax, then there's falling action and resolution. Mm-hmm. Now, in an American audience, falling action and resolution sometimes get... Uh, either cast aside mm-hmm. or there's a twist mm-hmm. um, that's introduced instead or something like that, especially if there's multiple plot lines going on at once. And um, you've got kind of the old soap opera model uh, in television today, mm-hmm. uh, in drama, where you know you resolve one thing, but there's still the other five sort of open plot lines that are going on. And so 
to me, what the Roll With It system really shines in is the ability to echo that, to show that. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, each each player is kind of able to take ownership of their character. Yes. And each of the characters kind of like, you, you, and like in all RPGs, all RPG groups, you tend to have kind of the people who take the lead and who kind of like become sort of, quote unquote, the protagonist and yeah, everyone sure. else is just sort of around the protagonist. And that can still happen here. And actually, it's, it's perfectly fine if that happens here. Oh, yeah. But at the same time, you're sort of ensuring with the way this works that everyone has their moments in their sp- in the spotlight yes. and everyone's got some sort of character development that is meaningful at least to that character if not to the story as well. Yeah, and it is built into the system. It is deeply ingrained in it mm. uh, to the point where uh, what I'm really hoping that we will uh, be able to release soon mm-hmm. <laughs> is a couple of examples of ourselves doing exactly this mm-hmm. uh, along with the system itself and so that over the next year or so um, you guys will have a, a really big library to pull from of this is this is our vision mm-hmm. um, you know, here's some some examples of the ways that you can play this. Some of the random things that we have done with it, mm-hmm. uh, and then take it take to the streets <laughs> yourself, um, and and be able to have some really fun times with it. That said, one of the neat things about it is the ability to write um, settings for it and for another secret project that we have mm-hmm. uh, in the works right now, which is not a diceless system but has similar, uh, let's call it ideology, mm-hmm. um, and. So one of the one of the things that um, I could see us doing for that is writing these different settings mm-hmm. uh, for the roll with it system and and just pretty much any any kind of Doc and Kruger property. Yeah, it's so. more more a setting book and less of a um, expansion for a particular system. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, and and it may change the rules just a little mm-hmm. bit here and there where needed, or but suggest how you can approach the setting in either of the systems. Exactly. Sort of but but really, what it's more about, or going to be more about is um, what would a character in this world uh, look like and have some suggestions for those character elements mm-hmm. that might be really good ones for archetypes. Yeah. Um, so if you, were, if you were doing, for example, something that was uh, noir, you might look at the classic archetypes of noir, like uh, the, the G-Man or the detective or the femme fatale. And mm-hmm. you know, we, could, we could talk about what, what some suggestions might be for those who... Uh, you know, want, want a little bit of help with that mm-hmm. idea, and this is not this is not a the same kind of thing as when you get a you know a, a traditional book. It's like this one costs five points and this one costs six <laughs> points. Yeah, not not at all. Mm-hmm. This is just um, a little bit of, of a push literarily mm-hmm. for um, for the GM and for the players, and I think um, I think there's a lot of really open potential for this. So I'm excited. I'm excited about what's coming yeah. for the next year or so. Yeah. This week's meaty topic of discussion. All right, so let's talk about empathy. Oh boy. Yeah. You get what I'm feeling right now? Uh, I mean, are you sharing my desire to I, talk about empathy? In that, I, I suppose. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I can't say for sure. <laughs> um, well, you know, this is an idea that's been on my mind lately. Uh, I think we've got a lot of really good reasons to empathize with others in our society and in our modern times. And I think we also have a lot of technology that gives us the illusion of empathizing. You know, the, the like button comes to mind. Mm. Um, resharing comes to mind. Things like that. But is that really empathy? Mm. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, my argument probably would be no. But, um, you know, this is a video game podcast, so let's talk not as much about that, though that is a huge part of gaming culture, mm-hmm. as about the games themselves. Um, first of all, the single-player single experience, does that um, take away our empathy, or do kids, does that have the potential to teach empathy? Um, of course, you're, you're, when you're interacting with a game system, you're interacting with the author of that story. You're interacting... With the creators of the system, you're mm-hmm. interacting with you know as the player. You've got your own narrative that you're telling, mm-hmm. um, and yeah. like any any art piece, you know the author can kind of go into it um, with or without an intention to do this, but going into it knowing what it is they're trying to communicate and what it is, what feeling they're trying to create in the in the audience. Well, and some games are very explicit about that attempt mm-hmm. to create empathy. Um, that's their agenda, if you will, especially some, uh, you know, like the, the, the interactive novels and things like that. Mm-hmm. Then you've got like uh, the, the PvP 
P space. Um, I'm going to frag a stranger. You know, what, is, what does that do for our empathy? Mm-hmm. And then the MMO space. You know, you've got guilds and, mm-hmm. and responsibilities mm-hmm. and things like that. So uh, let's dive into to some of those topics mm-hmm. and see, um, does gaming have the potential to help one's empathy? Mm-hmm. Is it treating empathy with a way that is giving us an empty shell that we believe is empathy? Um, Are we, as C.S. Lewis said, a generation of men without chests? Mm -hmm. Um, Meaning that we, you know, we think that we are doing something deep, but we're really hollow. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know. And I think I'd like to open this discussion. We can get a little bit more into like the sort of more subtle parts of empathy in games later, but we'll open, I think with empathy games. There's the term yeah. empathy game. And there are a lot of games recently that are what some people would call empathy games. Um, now, interestingly, uh, when I was doing a little bit of research on this recently, I found a lot of people who were writing articles and stuff like that that were claiming that um, games cannot teach empathy. And they felt very assured of that. Um, but it sounded to me as I was reading them that it kind of depends on how you define empathy. So let me sort of like present this example to you and then we can talk about how we define empathy. That's probably a good idea. Um, So, for example, there's this game called Dysphoria, which is very uh, well known, at least in the academic community, as being a game uh, it's kind of like, it's 8-bit, it's almost WarioWare-esque in its uh, its gameplay, and it's about gender dysphoria. Um, It's about a trans woman who is going through um, this uh, this therapy, um, hormones and stuff like that, talking about the experience of being a trans woman, of you know, going from being male to being female um, and gender and some of the struggles that come along with that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so a lot of people were saying after they played this game, and it is a, quite an interesting game, um, a lot of people were saying that they felt like they could really identify with what it's like to be trans. Um, and while, of course, the intent of the creator of this game um, was to create that feeling and to sort of like help people understand a little bit better, um, they also made the point that uh, you know, playing a game for five to ten minutes cannot help you actually identify with someone who's been going through this their entire life, right? Um, so there, there's kind of the question of... Um, and so in that sense, you can't fully empathize with this person and their experience because you've not had anything like that experience. And one could even argue that if you've been marginalized in some way um, throughout your life, maybe you're closer to that, but it's still not quite the same thing as having had that same experience. But if, for example, empathy, if, the, if a requisite of empathy is to have been through pretty much the exact same thing as someone else, then I would argue that we can't have any empathy at all. I do think, though, there's a difference between um, sympathy and empathy, where sympathy is just kind of like imagining that, like, oh, yes, that must be difficult for someone and feeling, you know, feeling, I don't know if, like, feeling bad for them is the right phrase, but, you know, kind of find... being able to recognize that they're going through something difficult and feeling for them. Yeah. Whereas empathy is closer to feeling what they feel. Right. Um, and so to kind of what degree that's possible, maybe it's a whole another question entirely. That, that's great. I mean, for, for example, since we are speaking in terms of games, mm-hmm. perhaps you play that dragon cancer and I play that dragon cancer. And then both of us hopefully can empathize with those who have dealt with the, uh, you know, the pain and the loss that comes with mm-hmm. childhood cancer, which is what that, that game is about. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, you and I then have a shared experience. Mm-hmm. That shared experience perhaps um, allows us to have an empathy with one another, mm-hmm. I- if you know what I mean, yeah, in, yeah, in that we have had that, that shared experience mm-hmm. of the fiction. Mm-hmm. And I'm, even the I'm not creator, saying that that's deep yeah. and meaningful <laughs> and the yeah. same thing as actually having both mm-hmm. survived cancer. Sure. That is not what I am saying. Mm-hmm. Uh, but... Perhaps it brings us a little bit closer to being more well-rounded and and, and healthy, mm-hmm. adulting, uh, emotional individuals. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and even the creator of that dragon cancer said, you know, so, sort of similarly that, um, and he he did not set out to make you empathize with him as a parent of someone or of a child with right. brain cancer. That's right. Um, but he said that he wanted to relay that experience and also to create certain feelings that you can relate to through this game. Um, sort of, you know, the the classical thing that happens in, say, literature and a lot of other stuff where we sort of find the things that speak to us in a piece. Right. Um, 
you know, feelings that we've had that like, you know, so I didn't go through exactly that. That reminds me of this time I had this feeling because of something else that happened, that sort of thing. And so kind of like my, my blanket stance on empathy games is that, uh, in a certain sense, no games can't teach you empathy, but I think the games are perfectly capable of creating, um, experiences that one can help you relate to people a little bit better, or at least to sort of like, I don't know, like for example, if you're trying to persuade them toward a stance, uh, they will. They can do a very good job of getting you closer to that and making you um, relate better and to understand just a little bit better, if not fully. But understanding that you're not truly empathizing. Like you know, I mean, maybe some people after playing a certain game might have gone from being close to empathizing to really empathizing because they have close enough experiences. Yeah. Um, but you know, we're the empathy we're creating is not kind of like, quote-unquote, full-on empathy, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, this takes us right up and edges us right up to the idea of um, fictopersonal relationships mm. or fictopersonal communication, which um, I, wrote, I wrote a paper on that, and um, I, I do believe it's one of our codexes, is it not? Um, I think it is, yeah. Yeah, um, and uh, so, so be sure to check that out if, if you're interested in that. But um, the the idea behind it in the, in, in the conference that I... I presented this at uh, was a transhuman uh, conference. It was the the idea of what do we do whenever uh, these fictional intelligences become uh, people that we feel like we have full on relationships with. And if that's not describing a video game scenario or at least a you know some kind of fictional narrative, I don't know what it is. Whenever we are uh, engaging as player, active participant, active agent within the context of the narrative, uh, and n- trying to have a meaningful drama character drama, relationship drama, that kind of a thing, with a person who's not real, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> you know, then how, how does that help us whenever the person becomes real? Mm-hmm. In other words, are the video game characters that we love, and, I'm not, and that's not too strong of a word, mm-hmm. um, are they more real to us than the real Facebook friends that we have who we, for example, maybe have never met but we know through large groups, um, you know, maybe we're on a we're on a video game group, or, or you were like acquainted because you went to high school together and right. had a few interactions. But for the most part, you lost touch, you got back yeah. together, whatever. Or it all, is. all you know about each other is just what you post on your Facebook. Right? Page. Yeah. Uh, you know, no, what, uh, I've got an old buddy who had a coming out experience. Mm-hmm. You know, and um, as a result of that, we took very different life paths. And so empathizing with his current situation and struggles and that sort of a thing sometimes can be a little bit uh, difficult for for me just because I don't know where he is Mm -hmm. uh, in life. And and we literally just didn't talk for a decade. It had not much to do with that Mm -hmm. as as much to do with uh, geographical things and Facebook not existing. The the natural thing where, uh, oh, I forget. I mean, people say lots of different things about stuff like this, but, you know, like you you freak out about your, your friends in high school and your social standing in high school. Right. But everyone who's been through high school is like, no, no, the people that you're friends with, you know, are maybe the people you meet in college. Right. Often not even that. Right. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> but, but my point is this, uh, you know, are, are there people that we know literally have, you know, have met, you know, the guy I'm talking about was in my wedding party for Pete's sake. Mm. Um, you know, it, it, is this somebody, uh, you know, that, that, is, that is less real in, in a relationship sense um, than a video game character or a fictional character? Mm. Um, you know, if there was a, if there was a, a game, uh, for example, where uh, a, a major, major character was killed off permanently, mm. You know, we'd feel very different than, uh, oh, no, I need to reload because Link just died. Mm-hmm. Right? You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's, it's not a reload. I mean, experience. you can look at uh, Eris from Final Fantasy VII. As, Perfect example. Yeah, as um, probably one of the best-known examples. Man, so. I shed a tear when Sulik died mm. in uh, Fallout 2. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, so this is, th- this is a very valid question, I think, is can mm. we tell those meaningful, heart-wrenching stories um, that – that take us to a very human, human place? Mm-hmm. I think the answer is yes. Video games can do this too. Um, does this help us with our empathy? Mm. We could just as easily back off from that and say, have you read a good book that mm-hmm. helps us with our empathy? Mm-hmm. And so I would argue very strongly that yes, video games can help us with our empathy. Mm-hmm. Now, what we do with that mm-hmm. then becomes... Mm-hmm. 
whether they can create the empathy or whether they can teach empathy, which was you know kind of to the point I was making earlier. A lot of people were asking the question: Can video games teach you empathy? Right. Um, and I think it really, I think it really, the answer probably is no, because it depends a lot on the audience. You know, are they receptive to this stuff? Are they thinking about it? Are they really trying to like? Are they just playing through it kind of absentmindedly, or are they actually taking it to heart? So what you're saying is. Um, somebody who somehow uh, mm-hmm. the emotionally dead person uh, is playing this game and goes, "Oh wow, uh, there's this new idea I've never considered before called empathy," mm. and I'm convinced <laughs> uh, that idea is no, we can't, we can't yeah, teach yeah. that. Yeah, but I, I don't even can... think that that's quite what I'm saying. Either, oh, okay. but you're, you're, you're on the right track, though. Okay. But yeah. Uh, but, but... Can you can you go from being non empathetic toward a person in a similar situation? Okay, so the assumption to being empathetic? the assumption is then that empathy is in our vocabulary whenever we begin, um, but maybe we're not necessarily empathizing with an individual mm-hmm. um, who struggles because of their race, mm-hmm. and then after playing that game, uh, we we say, "Wow, I really now understand uh, the the." Parts of this that I had never considered before, mm-hmm. elements of this I had never considered yeah. before. Mm-hmm. Okay, so this begs the question, to me at least, why there aren't more games out there explicitly doing this. It's because it wouldn't sell well. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, whenever I think of, uh, for example, black characters in video games, I'm taken to places like GTA, mm-hmm. and that's not where I want to go. Yeah, yeah. We actually had an episode of the podcast where we talked about black stereotypes. In yes, games. I remember. Um, I was not a part of that one. <laughs> yeah, that was actually before you were part of the crew. Yeah, it so. was, yeah. Um, but I, I remember listening to that one and going, man, these guys are these guys are hitting it hard. Yeah, I wanna- yeah. they, they had some really excellent points. Mm-hmm. Um Definitely go back and listen to that one if you guys get a chance. Yeah, it's, a, um, it's an early episode. It's a season one episode. Yep. So before I kind of address that question specifically of why aren't there more games that do this, I think, first of all, there's kind of a, a false assumption, and maybe it's just because of the, ten, the, the trends, the tendencies we see in current quote-unquote empathy games, um, of highlighting someone's struggle. Which it makes a lot of sense, you know. Yep. Even even in fiction, you know, pretty much any story is going to be based around some sort of conflict. Of course. Um, but, you know, there's also, you, you can be empathetic in the opposite direction. We tend not to think of it this way, but you can feel empathy for someone um, for, like, feeling happy about something or mm-hmm. feeling joyful about something. Or, sure, absolutely. Um, you know. Well, pathos just means emotion. Yeah. It's Greek. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there you go. Um, so, but, you know, that being said, that's just not the type of stuff we tend to um, create in games. Right. And so, you know, you could one could argue potentially that you can feel empathy um, toward like a moment of triumph quite easily in games, yeah. that sort of thing. Um, but usually those games, like while they are trying to create this feeling of triumph, it's not about feeling empathetic with triumphant people in a given situation, right? right? So we're, we're kind of we're assuming that what we're talking this about This new concept is, of triumph yeah. is uh, <laughs> interesting to me. I shall explore it. But we're, um, we're, we're focusing more specifically, as these <laughs> games tend to, on like people's struggles and kind of going through right. things that we might not understand. From well, that's where about. the story is, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a universal human connection. Condition. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it doesn't matter what color your skin is mm-hmm. or where you came from mm-hmm. or what culture you, you know, yeah. uh, you can trace your genetics to or whatever. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, gender and, 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 and orientation and that sort of thing. Everybody, mm-hmm. everybody struggles. Yeah. All, all, all of us, mm-hmm. um, even, and, even the most privileged among us. Yes, we, we all have our issues. <laughs> yes, the, you know, this is this is this is the married white man talking here, uh, forty years old, mm-hmm. uh, who has also spent the last two years being a full time dad, mm-hmm. is currently making seven twenty five an hour as a tutor mm-hmm. at his university. Uh, but the fact is, I'm going to university. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so my struggle is very different. Yeah. And so sometimes, yeah, it's difficult for me to empathize with somebody um, who has come from such a completely different place mm-hmm. than me. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, to, to, again, delve into my personal narrative a little bit, as I said earlier mm-hmm. in the podcast, I lived overseas. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I was a little boy, it was a very real threat, the, living in, in third world countries, that if I walked down the street by myself, I would be kidnapped mm-hmm. um, and, and be victimized. Uh, not it's not like America mm. out there. Yeah. Um, you know, this was a very real thing, and I had people, strangers on the street, come up to me, even when my parents were there, mm. uh, and, and pull out my hair and, and spit on me because of the color of my skin mm. and the language that I spoke and and that sort of a thing. I have experienced racism mm. um, a, a, in other countries, never really here. <laughs> yeah. uh, but you know, I've also I've also had 
opportunities and moments where um, people have assumed things about me that simply aren't true. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the most fun things is, is to be somewhere like a supermarket and have someone in the aisle uh, speaking Spanish and assuming I can't understand them. Mm. <laughs> it's like, no, I know exactly what you're saying <laughs> yeah, right now. <laughs> I mean, I'm, not, I'm not wanting to eavesdrop. Yeah, at the yeah. same time, you don't just break in with Spanish and go, oh, you know, hey, guys, you may want to you may want to go the next aisle over because yeah. I, just, I just got your bank password, you know, or whatever. <laughs> yeah. but, but it's like um, so, so, uh, so much of... Of, of the human condition requires empathy. We are mm. social creatures. Yeah. I mean, heck, you can look at chimpanzees, mm. and they're they're social creatures. You mm. know, uh, <laughs> they, you know, there was a study recently done on, on do animals laugh, mm. um, and, and the idea is that that laughing actually evolved out of uh, you know weird breathing that says, "Hey, uh, I'm not going to hurt you right now. Mm. We're, we're, I'm doing a friend. This is just pretend right now," mm. which means. Rats pretend. What an <laughs> odd idea, you know. And so, and these are the kind of things that are that are that are being studied. Mm-hmm. Um, what I, f- I am fascinated by in sort of a, a global social, um, global socio political type of setting is this empathy idea. Is it being stunted by our technology, or is it being uh, enhanced by our technology. If it's being stunted, we need to fix that. Mm. If it's being enhanced, then we need to recognize that and, and perhaps even in, encourage that, mm. so that um, more empathy. Because I think more, I think more empathy is a good thing. Mm. I mean, do you think that more empathy is a good thing? Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Okay, okay. And and so, kind of coming around full circle to the question you asked a few minutes ago of why aren't there more games like this? You yeah. Know? And I think the answer, you know, you kind of already answered yourself is, you know, it probably wouldn't sell well. And the, well, reason, that's the reason being is like, it's the same reason that, you know, sort of fine art, generally speaking, is more of a, um, it has a, has a narrower audience than pop art. Yeah. Does. There's a lot of personal taste. That uh, comes there's a lot of personal it. taste. Yeah, sure. There's, there has to be, um, a willingness to be open to certain experiences. Um, I think a lot of times when people sit down and play games, they, you know, don't want to be preached at quote unquote, even mm-hmm. if the game's not trying to do that. Um, there are people who, you know, maybe, um, are more or less closed minded than others and don't want to be kind of confronted with something they rather wouldn't be when they're just trying to sit down and have fun with the mm-hmm. game. And there's something to be said too, for, you know, there, there are definitely camps out there that say the game's, essentially are games and not stories. And of course, this is like a totally different debate that we've talked about before. We're not going to go into right now. Um, But, you know, games are kind of like, they are the systems. You know, there's like kind of, there's, there's game design and then there's like game design, if that makes sense, (laughs) where if you, if you sort of break down a game to its core components, it is about a system and you can sort of like replace all the nouns with, you know, a, you can replace like all the actions with, you know, just like other random verbs. Right. And talk about how you're just trying to get like, you know, this square to that rectangle, (laughs) you know, just to kind of like throw out game verbs. Yeah. Yeah. Game verbs. Um, And if you sort of, like, take away all the context around it, you know, the game's ultimately about that system. And so I think that there are people who find the fun in the system and and in sort of solving the puzzles that the system presents who don't care at all (laughs) about, you know, the cutscenes, for example. Or um, maybe you're just, like, kind of ignoring the this sort of aesthetic that has been put on top of the game system to give it context, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, it's a big difference between using squares and circles uh, to, you know, enact an abstract kind of a war than to throw somebody down into a terrorist situation and assign them a side. Mm -hmm. Um, That that suddenly becomes a very different thing, Mm -hmm. and and it's it's a lot easier to empathize than in in that situation than it is um, with a circle. How do you empathize with a circle? Mm -hmm. Um, So, what what we're talking about is the, the rich sociopolitical context mm. of a game or any setting really is, is going to change things. Um, I, you know, I, I would look to banned books as a great example of this, whatever the banned book list happens to be at the moment. Yeah. You know, sometimes it's Harry Potter, sometimes it's <laughs> uh, Huck Finn, but usually it has to do with um, who's offended by what. Mm-hmm. That's really what it comes down to. Well, being offended is sort of the flip side of empathy, 
in a way. Mm. Um, I mean, you know, there's, it's one thing to say, listen, I totally get you mm. and I completely disagree with you. Mm. And what you're saying as a rational, thought out process is illogical and it's not what I stand for. Mm. And we can say that that's, um, you know, th- that that's a certain kind of outrage. Mm. Um, but at the same time, you can simply go, I'm having a strong emotional reaction to what you just said, and I'm going to have no intent at all of trying to empathize with you. Mm. You're wrong, blah. You know? <laughs> and, and that's a very different process. Yeah. Um, so when we talk about empathy in that context, mm-hmm. I think that, that the negative um, lack of empathy needs mm. to be discussed as well. Yeah. Can we use games to teach that sort of yeah. a thing? And the, so, yeah, kind of going back to your question then also of... Are our games improving or hampering our ability to be empathetic? Right. And I think that, honestly, it's it's hard to say because I think that games in this sense, just like any other form of media, are um, a tool. It is a tool that can be used well because it's a tool that can be used badly, and mm-hmm. it also depends on whether or not people are willing to pick it up and engage with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that the fact that most games don't even try to do that yeah. Um, that the the games that are mass market are just kind of your standard, you know, shooters, racers, whatever the case might be. Yeah. They're not trying to teach empathy. They're just trying to be games. Yeah, that's true. And that's so, a very good point. Um, but as far as, you know, people who are willing to engage with the games that go and try to be empathy, be empathy games, then, yeah, I think that they absolutely can um, improve um, that thing. And so, honestly, I think it's it's less about... Like, say the question, do games in general do this? I think that if you're well, only looking at the games that people so are going to... abstract. Yeah, right. Um, Our games aren't. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that's a, no, another, don't even ask that question. Um, but, you know, so do, do games in general currently help or hamper uh, empathy? I think that the answer would probably be, if anything, they probably hamper. Mm-hmm. Um, if only because people are spending time not... Practicing empathy, sure. if that makes sense. Is that just because the games are not evolved enough? Or is it because we as a consumer base are encouraging the development of the certain type of game which would, by its nature, be more indulgent and less empathetic? The latter. Okay. I, I think it's definitely the latter. And yeah. I think it's I, I don't think it's I'd because like, you know, I don't think it's the whole thing like, oh, games make people violent or whatever. Because no, no, no. I mean there's still studies that try to show that like yes, they tend to or like they like in children, children can be like more antisocial or less aggressive or more aggressive. Right. That sort of thing. But I think that that's more just like lifestyle choices Dude, than if you're it playing is. Call of Duty eighteen hours a day, mm-hmm. it's gonna have an effect on you. And it's not even because you're shooting people eighteen hours a day, it's because you are not engaging with society eighteen <laughs> yeah, hours okay. a day. Yeah. <laughs> And so, I mean, it's, it's, it's like sort of take the game out of it. Like how much are you, again, practicing empathy? Right. Because it's a skill. It's something that you have to, like any, any social skill, you have to be out there and you have to be engaging with people in yeah, order to improve it. Absolutely. Well, and, it, and it's like whenever someone says, oh, well, all of my friends are, um, you know, on, online, meaning in the game system. Mm-hmm. My, my gaming friends are my, are my friends. I, I'm, I wonder, and and this is not accusatory in any way at all, mm-hmm. but what always comes to my mind is, okay, is this a very, very wide ocean that's only three inches deep? Or, you know, as opposed to, say, the metaphor of a well, mm-hmm. which would be very small, but, but, but very, very deep. See, I consider my relationship with my wife mm-hmm. uh, of, of almost 16 years to be something that is fairly narrow mm-hmm. in the sense of we have a very specific type of relationship, yeah. but very, very deep. Mm-hmm. She's also my best friend. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, th- there is that difference. And, and I, I love the time that I spend with her and we spend lots of different types of, of things together. But if on the surface, if someone was just to look, mm-hmm. they might make the mistake that, uh, you know, oh, well, this is, this is just his wife. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Sure. Yeah. Um, whereas um, if, if you look at someone who has a thousand friends on Facebook you might go, wow, that's somebody who's really, really connected. Mm-hmm. But if they don't have any meaningful relationships with anybody at all, mm-hmm. a- including their mom and dad, um, you know, it's like it, you, maybe you need to maybe you need to get out of the house a little, buddy. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe <laughs> maybe you need to, to hit some different types of websites and try to meet some people. Mm-hmm. I don't know, um, and so that. The reason that I keep mentioning social media specifically Mm -hmm. is because so many of our video games now 
are modeling these ideas of social media. Um, you know, we, we had we had the trend back in it was like 2007 through 2009-ish of um, the Facebook game phenomenon. You remember, uh, of course, Farmville yeah. mm-hmm. and Frontierville and all of those. Um, and now we've gone into the mobile space because our phone technology has caught up with that. And so basically they're, we're downloading the apps mm-hmm. instead. Yeah. Um, and, and I remember that weird kind of transition time whenever it's like does Farmville have an app no Farmville doesn't have an app Mm -hmm. Uh, they they will never get an app for that and now if you you know if you want to play these social games um, which is what they were called Mm -hmm. social games uh, there's really no substance to it you're not interacting with anybody in a meaningful Real time way. Yeah, you're going to their it's very, virtual yeah, space. A- it's just like your virtual space, yeah. and and harvesting their crops. And we don't we don't play Farmville yeah, much it's, anymore. It's asynchronous. Nobody really and, does. And there's I think the and actually people have talked about this a little bit. The the social game, like the way they monetize it, is by basically counting on you wanting to be better than someone you know in real life. Yeah. In so theory. you fake it so, by paying real money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So um, so I you know. It's funny. There's been a lot of criticism for Pokemon Go. Mm. Say what you will about it. I think that the way that they monetized was brilliant. As opposed to, um, hey, look at what I did in Pokemon. Well, look what I did in Pokemon. Well, look what I did in Pokemon. You know, what, what you're purchasing is the ability to go out and do those things. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, so I, I, I kind of admire their little model. And, and some of the changes they've made recently with some of the updates and features they're bringing back in. You know, if you enjoyed it when it came out at the beginning, you might want to hop back on and just check it out again and see if it's something you want to jump back into. I've really enjoyed it. I liked their Halloween thing mm-hmm. with all the, the ghostly. Yeah, the ghosts up. popped up. Those were fun. <laughs> um, but um, anyway, that you know, that phenomenon, I bring it up specifically because it got people out of the house mm-hmm. and connecting in social ways, maybe not meaningful ways, maybe not empathizing in that way. But my question is, is empathy an on-off switch or is it a um, kind of a spectrum? You know, uh, it, it came out when I was in Oxford and, and that was fun because I was taking a class. But um, I, I walked down the street and I saw this um, this girl on a bike, sort of the, uh, the, the classic stereotypical uh, just after dark scenario. Um, and she was kind of kind of freaking out a little bit, and so it, it caught my attention. I'm like, what, "What's what's going on over there?" And there was this dude standing next to her, um, and, and and he was black. Mm. And I'm going, I'm going, whoa, you know, is this a is this a moment? I mean, it, I don't, I don't want to because you don't want to. I don't want to read into this. Yeah, you don't want to believe that. You don't want to stereotype anyone. But at the exactly. same time, like, yeah. And what I realized very, very quickly was mm. she had her phone out. Mm. He was standing over her shoulder. He had her by the shoulders actually, and she was capturing uh, a rare Pokemon and getting really excited about uh. it. And he was congratulating her nice. and cheering her on. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, you know, I don't know if they knew each other, if they were strangers or yeah, what. But yeah. he had his phone out too. And they were they were bonding. They were having this total empathy moment. Mm-hmm. And, and 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 honestly, those immediate uh, sort of biases that I brought into that were completely my own. Mm-hmm. They were totally on me. Mm-hmm. Those two weren't thinking about race. Mm-hmm. They weren't thinking about sex. Well, he might have been. I don't know. Uh, but uh, you know, they they weren't thinking about uh, you know the the stuff that demographically separated them, mm-hmm. socioeconomically separated them, mm-hmm. politically separated mm-hmm. them. They weren't thinking about any of that stuff. They were yeah. thinking about catching Pokemon. Yeah. And so to me, that I think is huge. Mm-hmm. And if we don't take that into the next years um, and into the next generations, we're really dropping the ball. Mm-hmm. We're missing something important, huge. Mm-hmm. And I think that that just sort of speaks, you know, again, generally speaking, into the ability for um, pop culture anything to be a common ground through which people can kind of come together and get over the sort of differences that we've had ingrained into us. Well, that's what pop means. Yeah. It's popular. Yeah. I mean, you but, know, but it makes sense. But you get my, you get my point. Though. No, like, I totally you know, get your point. You have, you have two people who don't know each other at all and don't know where to start um, trying to get to know each other, but we've both seen this movie that we liked. Right. And being able to talk about that movie is kind of like almost the icebreaker. That it's, the, it's a common language that we can use to then go into whether or not like we might become better friends or get yeah. to know each other. Well, for my that's wife right. and I, it was Spaceballs. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, Speaks to my age a little bit, probably. But see, I mean, this is this is obviously a very 
a very big, very complex topic that, you know, it's hard to talk about this too in depth in the course of, you know, a half hour, 40, 40 well, minutes. I feel closer to you. I feel like I've empathized. <laughs> we, we've with empathized you. a little bit. And uh, hopefully you, dear listeners, can empathize with us a little bit more as we've uh, shared this little bit of an experience here. Uh, but, hopefully, yeah. <laughs> um, Those two guys, they're crazy. They don't know what they're talking yeah, about. Yeah, there you go. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I think, I think you know, it, it sort of just to reiterate the points that I've been making is that, you know, the, the games – they don't they don't teach you empathy. You're not going to become empathetic by playing a game. Right. I do think though that they can they can persuade, they can open your mind to certain things, they can maybe make you um softer towards certain people, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um and they can they can sort of help you to relate to people a little bit better. And ultimately you know, there's there's life experience, and they go. Then each person's individual life experience is going to define who they are as a person. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that media in general can be one way that um, a person can be defined. You can get experiences outside of what you would normally experience. And so, in that sense, I think that games have a have an ability to broaden someone's viewpoint, sure, but not necessarily to make them more empathetic inherently. Um, and so they, they play into it, but they don't define. Well, you know, I'll buy that um, with one proviso, mm-hmm. and that proviso is this. Media is meant to influence. Mm-hmm. That is the purpose That's of true. it. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, the, any, any book, mm-hmm. uh, any television show, any movie, any, uh, any video game mm-hmm. is when you walk out of there, is meant to have changed yeah. your mind in some way. Mm-hmm. Even if it's just to have entertained you mm-hmm. and got your adrenaline pumping and you know, it was a big popcorn film, mm-hmm. uh, it was supposed to make you walk away remembering it and go, well, that was a great thing. As, I, as I've heard some authors put in, this is not an exact quote, I'm paraphrasing, but basically writing is uh, tweaking your brain for fun. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's it's, yeah. it's and, trying to create feelings in you artificially um, to achieve a particular end for that story. And in the case of games with an agenda, and mm-hmm. that's not a dirty word, you mm-hmm. uh, you know, whether it be I, I, want, I want people to be able to identify with this process of, uh, you know, identity shifting that I had or I want somebody to understand the, the complex difficulties that are being faced by third world nations whenever they have to make choices about, uh, you know, water cleanliness or you know, what, just whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I would I would point to like uh, the the Walking Dead series as being a really great example of empathy, mm. uh, not just not just the video game, but like the whole transmedia. What is that show really about? It's about hey, I am your friend, and I and I and I love you, and we're going to survive together, and and family, and all that stuff. But ultimately, if it comes down to survival, uh, we're in a new post-apocalyptic zombie wasteland, um, and if it means that uh, I have to choose between my son and my best friend, I'm going to shoot you in the head. Mm. I mean, that's what that's what the show is about. Mm-hmm. Um, it's about empathy on that level, and and knowing where it ends, and and then that's and exploring the morality of it. So. Um, that influence is being brought to bear against us um, on, in every piece of media that we consume, and so that's my that's my proviso mm. against what you said. Mm. Yeah, I, I really I really do think that it can teach empathy. Mm. So I will disagree with you yeah. on that. that that's I, I think that's that it can in yeah. that sense. And I would I would and say partly that that's just because we defin- we just define we empathy find, a little yeah. differently. That's true. That's very true. And Which I, is where I, we started. And I'll say that you know I, I think that developers do need to keep in mind that they do have a responsibility as creators. Right. Right. To keep in mind what it is that they're getting across in these games. Yeah. And some of it really does come down to this game is for fun and it's about this stuff. Um, and we understand that it's a game and it's not actually real life and all this different stuff. But you have right. to keep in mind that people will be affected by it in some way. Yeah. And you have to be careful with some of the messaging that you have and that sort of thing. Correct. As you're developing. Absolutely correct. So... Anyway, I think that's a good place to wrap up. Cool. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us for episode number 83 of the backward compatiblecom podcast, our discussion on empathy in games. Uh, I'm Chris. I'm Doc. And we'll see you next time. We wanted to join your discussion because dialogue makes everyone better. Want to hear our thoughts on a particular game or topic? Get in touch with us on Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, YouTube, or at our website, backward-compatible.com. And we might feature your question on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward compatible.